Hello and welcome to another episode of ATA Digital's podcast series. Um, in this uh, present season, we are looking at the book Asian Christian Theology, uh, Evangelical Perspectives. And during the course of the season, we have been interviewing and are talking to the authors of different chapters from this book uh, and trying to get their perspectives on how they wrote the uh, chapter, what it means uh, for our daily Christian lives, and also getting to know the authors a bit uh, beyond the words in these pages. And today it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Karyong Lin uh, with us. Um, he has written um, the chapter in the book called uh, The Theology of Suffering and Mission for the Asian Church. And this, is, this will be our main uh, topic for discussion today. To just give a brief introduction about, about Dr. Karyong Lin, he is uh, a lecturer in New Testament Studies and Director of Postgraduate Studies at Seminary Theology Malaysia. He's also the Dean of the STM Kuala Lumpur Center and he has a PhD in New Testament studies uh, from the University of Wales. Now I can go more because if you go to his website, you'll find a lot more information there, but this is just to get us started. Uh, he's an author of uh, numerous books and chapters in books and he's edited, uh, he's been an editor too, but I'll just give you a brief idea of what uh, he has written uh, in more recent years. Uh, uh, first, he, uh, I would like to mention Following Jesus, an Illustrated Guide to the Places of the Holy Land, according to the Gospel of Mark. This is a 2019 publication. Then we have Metaphors and Social Identity Formation, Paul's letters, uh, Letter to the Corinthians. And this is a 2017 publication. And Jesus, the Storyteller, Hearing the Parables Afresh Today, a 2015 publication. So we can see there are many interesting titles that he has been involved with, including the chapter that we are discussing today. Welcome, Dr. Karyong Lim, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it is great to have you. So I gave a very brief and bare bones uh, introduction of you. Uh, but maybe uh, tell us more about yourself in your own words about your work. What are you passionate about? What are you working on nowadays? Yeah, I'm basically passionate about anything that is related to New Testament uh, studies. So I've done a fair bit of research on Paul's uh, letters to the Corinthians. I've also worked on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I've uh, researched a fair bit on the life of Paul. Uh, that's basically uh, my academic work. And I'm also a priest with the Anglican Church, with the Diocese of uh, West Malaysia. And I also volunteer uh, as a member of the Board of Trustees with World Vision Malaysia and also involved uh, in the Bible Society uh, of Malaysia. Wow, that's a lot of things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you are really busy, so thank you for making time. Uh, and uh, I especially like the connection that you uh, maintain despite being in academia with the local church by being a priest also, which is very significant to the work that we are trying to do here. Uh, trying to um, maybe um, reiterate the connection between academia, academic work, and the local church, and, and not just in a one-way top-down relationship, but in a two-way conversation. So I am looking forward to the conversation we're going to have. Although I must say the topic uh, for uh, uh, of your chapter is a difficult one, and uh, let's just dive straight into it. Uh, talking about... Uh, uh, the theology of suffering and its study. In your chapter, you mention uh, all those suffering for the sake of the gospel is a prominent theme in the New Testament and particularly in Paul's epistles. This theme has received too little attention from scholars of missions and the New Testament. So I want to start us off by a very basic question. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a lack of suffering in human history, right? Uh, I mean, we've had suffering not just in Asia, but across the globe. Why then do you think that uh, the theology of suffering has not received much attention and mission in biblical scholarship? Yeah, I, yeah, you're quite right to say that there's so much human suffering if you look through the course of history. And I think there's much that has been written on the topic of suffering itself, uh, the topic on theodicy or the question or the problem of evil or the question of why God allows uh, suffering. But when it comes to 
mentioned and Christian weakness, much less has been written on this subject. And I think as evangelicals, our focus tend to be on fulfilling the Great Commission. That's why when we talk about mission or we talk about evangelism, it is reaching the unreached people groups. I think that is the primary drive or the focus when we talk about Christian mission and the New Testament. So obviously, it seems to me that um, there's much less focus written on uh, the topic of suffering. And also, if we glance through many of the textbooks on missions, uh, many of these are actually written from oh, the Western context or the Western perspective. Perhaps within the Western context, suffering or being persecuted for one's uh, Christian faith uh, may be alien in, in the experience in the West, but not so for us in Asia. We see suffering uh, uh, and Christian weakness uh, taking place every day in our daily lives. So that is where I try to fill in this little gap uh, as a nation myself, trying to reflect on this topic as, uh, as Christian weakness uh, in the Asian context and also within the context of Christian mission. Hmm. That, that, that is helpful for us to get an idea and frame the chapter as a whole. So <clears throat> it is not that uh, theology has not contemplated suffering as a concept but it is its connection to mission and uh, the encounter of suffering uh, and its relationship to mission that has uh, not been uh, addressed as well. Am I right? Uh, uh, okay. And, and that is helpful because that helps us see what the chapter is about. Now, again, as I said in the beginning, this is a difficult topic and uh, you, you've been a priest also. It's not something that people would want to preach on uh, generally or talk about. So what motivated you to take on this aspect of theology? And I've noticed this is not just uh, necessarily this chapter in the book. You've written papers on this, and this is a topic that you've addressed. Or to put it a little differently, um, why do we need to give more attention uh, to developing a theology of suffering today in Asia, especially when we are... Um, in Asia, developing economies were seeking prosperity and trying to uh, break the cycle of suffering and be prosperous generally. Uh, why do we need to pay attention to this today? Yeah, what uh, prompted me to rethink on this whole subject of suffering is actually the story of a missionary uh, to the Philippines. Um, uh, Gracia Burnham. I mentioned uh, her book uh, in the introductory part of the chapter. So Gracia and her late husband, Martin, had been missionaries to the Philippines. And uh, together with her late husband, they were actually kidnapped and held hostage by a radical Islamic terrorist group. And unfortunately, the husband was killed and Gracia um, survived. And she testified in her book that in their training as missionaries, they were warned about suffering, but this never really hit her until she was held hostage as missionaries. So following that, I, I did some informal research. So I started by asking mission agencies that I know of, and I asked them about their training and their preparation. And I asked the question, how much suffering or persecution for the sake of bringing the gospel as a missionary, how much of this topic is covered in the curriculum, in the training and the preparation for the missionaries? And the answer I got is, we never thought of this topic before. <laughs> it was negative. So that prompted me uh, uh, to think perhaps there is room for us to take this topic seriously, more so uh, within the context of uh, Asia. I also mentioned in my chapter that if you look through the large majority of persons persecuted Christians in the world, a large majority of these actually come from Asia. And that actually prompted me in my own PhD studies when I work on Paul's sufferings in um, Second Corinthians. Mm, this is um, a really helpful insight into how you as a scholar uh, get into writing what you write, because there's a very close connection with daily life and experiences and things that you encounter. And I think uh, I would put this as an encouragement to our uh, uh, students in our audience uh, who will be 
uh, getting into theological studies. The theology is not just an abstract uh, subject that we study and uh, contemplate abstract things. It's about everyday experiences and things that are happening around us. That prompts theology. So th thank you. That, that is really helpful. Uh, that's a helpful insight into um, the process of how uh, uh, you write and how you get into things. Uh, jumping into uh, the next sections, uh, section where you talk about Paul's perspective on suffering, you write, Paul's understanding of his suffering is not to be divorced from his apostolic mission. Whenever Paul mentioned his suffering, particularly in 2 Corinthians, it was directly related to his apostolic mission. His suffering was a direct result of the proclamation of the crucified Messiah, in which the power of God was revealed. So this is interesting, um, especially when we consider approaches to the gospel and Christian life, which are popular and growing, which emphasize the positives of it. Uh, we, we, we want it to be attractive. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing a church which uh, emphasizes suffering may not be the most... <laughs> In, inviting place for people. So, uh, so we uh, emphasize positives like good health, healing, uh, prosperity, financial prosperity also. But then uh, is suffering somehow inherently part of the gospel too, other than these aspects? If so, how? Yeah, in my early days of my uh, PhD, journey. I had the opportunity of presenting a short paper in the missions conference. So I, 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 I asked the question uh, for, uh, for us to reflect on, is suffering a consequence to mission? Uh, that means I suffer because I obeyed the Great Commission, or is suffering intrinsic to mission, that suffering is considered part and parcel of our Christian weakness? Interestingly, I had two uh, responses. One of them uh, is a missionary to Africa. He's from the uh, developed nation. And he suggested that uh, suffering is actually a consequence to mission. Uh, he argues that uh, because he obeyed the Great Commission, he has to give up his comfortable job. He has to give up uh, where he used to live and move to, 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 to Africa, to a tropical country in Africa where humidity, <laughs> where there's high humidity, the heat is unbearable, <laughs> you know, just like me in Malaysia, you know. See, so suffering is a consequence of uh, mission. And to that, uh, I have another pastor who was formerly who was from the former Soviet Union, so he lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he shared his testimony that while they were under the Soviet regime, uh, he was threatened by the authorities. He was told that he should not mention the name of Jesus at all, and if he were to do so, he will be arrested. And this particular pastor said, of course, he 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 didn't obey all those uh, he, uh, all those uh, threats that were given to him. So he basically continued on proclaiming uh, the gospel of Christ, and he was thrown into prison. But the interesting thing is, he said that when I was in prison, everybody in prison knew why. I was there. It is because of the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The authority asked me to zip my mouth, and here I am in prison. I don't even have to open my mouth. Everybody knew why I was there. So suffering is part and parcel of mission. And so uh, when, I, when I listened to these two responses, it sort of hit me that perhaps we tend to think of suffering as a consequence as a result of we or being Christ, or as a result of we taking the Great Commission to the ends of the world. But having listened to this pastor from a former Soviet Union, it, it hit home that perhaps we need to rethink of our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, where Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him uh, daily. Mm. Mm. I... Yeah, I, I like that um, example that you gave um, because um, in it, there are two perspectives, uh, one of a Western missionary going to Africa and then uh, the experience of uh, a pastor in the Soviet Union. Um, 
and it would seem that our perspective on suffering and um, I think like neither of them are incorrect or mutually exclusive, uh, but our perspective on suffering and mission also depends a lot on where we are located and how we experience our world. And, uh, uh, but the perspective that came from the Soviet pastor is helpful because oftentimes uh, if we just see suffering as a consequence of mission, uh, we'll find, try to find ways of avoiding or removing uh, suffering. So that is helpful. Um, so let's dig in a little further into this. Um, uh, so if we understand that the gospel mission and suffering are um, so closely tied together, uh, that it's a part of mission itself, um, a part of the gospel itself, how does this impact uh, our local churches and our theologizing as local churches when it comes to uh, our tendency to emphasize the positive uh, uh, side of the gospel and look only at that side, uh, what challenges does this pose to us? Mm, thanks for that. Um, I can think of the uh, testimony of Gracia Burnham that I mentioned early on in the beginning. Years later, uh, Gracia actually shared that he had the opportunity to be in touch with her captives, the um, the Islamic militant groups that held her and her late husband uh, hostage. And this, um, she shared that based on the information that she has received, a number of the, her captives, uh, a number of those who helped her in captivity, uh, turned to Christ as a result of her and her late husband's testimony during their year-long in captivities. Now, Grace actually shared that if only she had knew back then that there would be this sort of positive outcome of her captivity, where those who held her hostage would turn to Christ subsequently, uh, she said that it would have made her horrible experience more bearable. It was in hindsight that she realized that there's something positive could come out from what she has gone through when she was held hostage for uh, for more than a year. And through all this experience, she says that we can actually see God at work turning suffering. We often view that as something that's negative into something that is positive. And I think this is closely related to what I was trying to bring out in this chapter. If you look at Paul's life, he suffered so much, but what positive uh, impact uh, will come out of this. And Paul said that it is for your comfort, as he was telling the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, I suffer so that it is for your comfort, so that you may also share uh, the comfort that I receive from my suffering. So I think there is this uh, very close um, relationship between suffering and how it could minister to someone else. And I mean, being a pastor as well, sometimes uh, I do find that some of the pain that I've gone through in my own life, I've been able to identify with those that I'm reaching out to as well. So I think there is this positive impact in our present reality as well. Mm. That is uh, interesting and helpful because uh, uh, you brought brought up two aspects of it. One, uh, that my suffering can minister to others as even as I suffer. And the other aspect was my suffering also allows me to minister to others as I learn and can empathize better with them. So it impacts both the other and myself, the suffering that I undergo. That, 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 that is beautiful. Uh, which again, uh, makes me um, look at this quote uh, and this part of the chapter. Uh, and you mentioned briefly about Paul and Second Corinthians. Paul claimed that his suffering had positive missiological benefits for the Corinthians. Paul clearly states that it was through his suffering that the Corinthians received comfort and salvation and even life. There is no ambiguity in uh, Paul's language, language when he states that the Corinthians were the direct beneficiaries of his suffering. M moving ahead, you write, suffering could possibly uh, be the instrument to... Um, which God makes his glory known. So uh, 
this is interesting and a challenging point I'm thinking about, uh, especially evangelical perspectives on suffering and glory. Uh, <clears throat> there's almost this sequential uh, uh, way of viewing it. We suffer uh, and later through that suffering, we achieve glory, which is a later state of being. Um, so it's like an overcoming of suffering leads to glory. But from this uh, uh, little uh, bit on Paul, and uh, and for our audiences, read the chapter, there's a lot more uh, on this. Uh, it would seem that glory is achieved not just once, once suffering has been overcome, but uh, it would make it seem that there is glory even when the suffering exists and maybe even within the suffering. Is, is that true? How do they go to together? I mean... This sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, if I can go back to the story that I shared earlier on about this pastor from the Soviet Union. Mm. Now, we see he suffered. Uh, he was thrown into prison. There's obviously suffering. But because of his presence in prison, uh, people got to know uh, about the reason why he was there. That is because he suffered mm -hmm. for Christ, because he identified himself with Christ. And, and the people in prison knew that he was there because of the sake of the gospel. And actually, he shared that that itself is the power of God working in and through him, that uh, there can be glory. Glory in a sense, not so much of glorifying himself, but glory to God in a sense that uh, the people who were in prison wouldn't have heard or wouldn't have known about Jesus if not for his presence there. And I think this is where we see the, the, the paradox. We think of it suffering as negative. How can something that's so negative could possibly have a positive uh, outcome? And it's a real paradox. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. mm, so this is helpful because uh, you pointed out um, the glory of God. That's a key uh, perspective that we often um skip over or gloss over where we almost equate our glorification with the glory of god but it's possible in a particular situation like the soviet pastor he's suffering and and uh, it is fine to say that his uh, own situation as a human being uh, for human eyes is not glorious he is in prison and yet god is being glorified in that situation in his suffering that that, that is helpful uh, uh, so, uh, re again, related to Paul, you'd say that Paul, uh, through his suffering, Paul, that Paul was able to identify with the sufferings of Christ and experience the power of God working through his weakness and the power of the Holy Spirit in the proclamation of the gospel. So, a, a question, uh, and this maybe uh, seems silly and simple, but... Uh, if Christ has already suffered and been crucified from the dead, why must one suffer to identify with Christ? Because it's already done, right? Hasn't uh, he suffered so that we do not suffer? Yeah, I think this goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier on. I'm just reflecting on what Jesus said to his disciples. Uh, if anyone wants to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me uh, daily. I think uh, by taking our crosses and following Jesus, that is our identification uh, with mm. Christ. But when I was growing up, uh, of course, I must say that I have not gone through the kind of suffering that Paul has gone through in my own life. But when I was growing up, when I was, uh, when I was in my primary and my uh, high school days, uh, I was probably the only Christian in the entire class. And because I was the only Christian, my classmates um, would often poke fun at me and call me all sorts of names just because uh, uh, I identify myself as a Christ uh, followers. And I've I've also, because I, I came from the Christian family, so obviously there's no objection for me to follow Christ. But I have classmates uh, who came from non-Christian families, and when they make a decision to become a Christian, um, they face objection from, the, from their families. And I, I have a classmate whose parents objected to him being baptized as a Christian. And coming from that kind of background, 
uh, where I was growing up, Christianity is often viewed as a Western uh, religion. In fact, there was a saying, I mean, I'm ethnically Chinese, uh, there was a saying that say that one additional Christian, one less Chinese, because that is the perception that people tend uh, to have. So even in our daily reality, in our daily lives, we may not have gone through persecution or suffering as to the extent of what Paul has gone through. But in our own daily life, we also face the challenge of being uh, being persecuted in that sense uh, as being identified with Christ. So I think in that sense, we can see uh, our uh, living out our Christian witness can, uh, as a daily reality. We do face resistance. We do face um uh, some sort of uh, inconveniences. We do face some sort of uh, suffering, even though, even though it may not be the magnitude as what Paul has uh, experienced. Mm. So th that is helpful. Uh, I think it uh, helps me um, understand uh, the point better. So it is not so much that um, we are actively trying to identify with Christ by uh, finding suffering or uh, through suffering that we find, but it is a reality of following Christ. As you said, take up your cross is a reality of following Christ. And thereby, if you follow Christ, you will suffer. So the theology of suffering that you're uh, developing here or uh, seeking to develop uh, is addressing a reality that we already experience. Am I right? That? Yes, that's right. <laughs> mm. uh, please, uh, you about to add something to that? Yes, uh, I also, perhaps I could also share a little bit from my own uh, context. I mean, I come from mm -hmm. Malaysia, a majority Muslim country. Now, there's, of course, there's freedom of religion. We are not uh, persecuted because we are Christians. But there are situations uh, where you have m people who come from the Muslim background when they were converted to become a Christian. They have gone through tremendous suffering. In fact, I alluded to a number of court cases uh, in my chapter that talk about how mm. these people who were from, who are from Muslim background when they were converted, they have gone through uh, a lot of persecution and a lot of suffering and there were legal cases uh, involving them as well. So these are all uh, documented legally. So that's what I mentioned in my chapter as well. So there's this uh, reality of people wanting to follow Jesus and they were being persecuted. And I think if you look at uh, uh, the large majority of, uh, 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 of, um, of countries in, in Asia, we see, we see people suffered because they, they wanted to follow Jesus. I think within your own context in India as well, you see that. And we also see that in, in the context of Pakistan, Bangladesh, in Thailand, uh, and many parts of uh, Asia as well, and also in the Middle East. So we see this is actually a, a, a present reality in our own life. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier on, this kind of uh, present reality was probably not reflected upon uh, by our western friends in their in their in their writings on mission or the theology of mission and that is why i'm trying to fill up this gap uh, in, in this chapter <laughs> mm. that uh, yeah that makes sense and uh, uh, as an indian myself i can attest to the fact that this is an intrinsic part of uh, being indian and christian uh, and more so in other neighboring countries. Uh, so that also uh, um, makes me uh, think that your uh, chapter is a good example of the task of theology. Um, it, it is to make sense of uh, the world around us, but not just through concepts, uh, uh, abstract concepts, uh, but by relating it to the Bible. I, I think you do it really well in your chapter where you take a concrete example from the Bible, the life of Paul uh, and focusing on second Corinthians and through that makes sense of a contemporary issue. That is very helpful. Um, so now talking of suffering, um, and this has been my observation um, in Asian churches. Uh, and this has also been a critique by many uh, Western missionaries who uh, uh, I've interacted with. 
that Asian churches tend to literally take on the suffering of Christ uh, and sometimes by uh, taking on physical suffering as an act of penance. Uh, uh, in the Philippines, we have examples of people uh, getting crucified, uh, literally, <laughs> and not taking up the cross in a figurative sense, or, uh, but literally taking up the cross. Um, and uh, what would your response to these situations be in light of the fact that suffering did allow uh, Paul to identify with Christ and experience the power of God's work through his weakness and the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, yet we have these practices in churches in Asia where people uh, take on physical suffering as an act of penance also. Yeah, I think there is a difference in inflicting pain on ourselves as an act of penance in order to find favour with God. And I think if you look at Paul's life carefully, uh, I do not think that Paul would deliberately seek out for suffering. If you read the book of Acts, we see at times uh, Paul actually ran away or escaped suffering. Like we, we read, for example, that he was lowered down in a basket in order that he can avoid being persecuted by others. But at other times, we see that when persecution came, Paul uh, willingly embraced it. So if you look carefully at his life, perhaps um, Paul is not actively looking for suffering or deliberately uh, wanting to seek for suffering. I think there's a difference between that, you know, that um, suffering, yes, is a present reality, but we don't need to inflict pain on ourselves in order for us to gain favor or, or to inflict pain ourselves as our act of penance in order to be reconciled with God. And that's where I think the question that you raised earlier on about Christ's work being complete on the cross, I think that is where we rest on Christ's completed work on the cross. <laughs> you know, uh, in terms of our, our, our relationship with God, in terms of our being reconciled with God, in terms of finding favor with God, Christ has done it. Mm. Mm -hmm. that, that's um, that, that, that's helpful. Um, um, so there is a difference between suffering that you encounter in living a Christian life, being engaged in mission, versus seeking out suffering from a more instrumental perspective, uh, uh, or um, uh, almost like a formula to uh, gain favor with God. There is a difference between the two. Um, uh, in the next section, uh, you segue from uh, the reflection on Paul and his life, uh, and you look at some contemporary issues. So uh, before we get into discussing uh, on those issues, I would like for our audience who, uh, who are not familiar with the situation in Malaysia also to get some perspective on it. Uh, you note that... Um, uh, there has been a strong Islamic resurgence uh, in Malaysia and Christian mission and witness has become increasingly difficult, right? Uh, my question is, what has led to the strong Islamic resurgence in Malaysia? Was it always this way and uh, or <clears throat> has there been some shift? Can you give us a glimpse into the situation and how things got to where they are today. Yeah, I think the shift uh, in Malaysia happened um, in the early 1980s. Now, in, the, the interesting part about in Asia is that when you talk about religion, you talk about ethnicity, it all goes together. It all goes together. You just can't separate one from the other. I mean, typically, if you look if you look at the context in Malaysia, if you in a multi-ethnic country like Malaysia, if you are a Chinese, you're often associated as being a, a Buddhist or one who embraces uh, Chinese folk religion. If you are Indian, you are a Hindu. If you are a Malay, you are a Muslim. So ethnicity and religious faith somehow um, they all closely connected, they're all interwoven together. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Islamic religion, re resurgence in Malaysia, we're not talking about a religious re re revival per se. It is also uh, a, pol a political and nationalistic movement as well. So with, you, if you put politics, you put uh, ethnicity, you put religion together, uh, things, get, things can get a little bit uh, complicated. So oftentimes, it's just not purely a religious re revival. I'm not saying it's not, it is, but it, there's also other agenda that were behind all this uh, movement. There is political agenda, there is nationalistic uh, agenda involved as well. 
yeah. So that's what happened in, in Malaysia that leads to a, a strong Islamic resurgence since the uh, 1980s. Mm. Uh, so uh, I like how you put that because uh, it shows the complexity and uh, the need for more nuanced answers or analysis in this situation that we cannot just say it's an uh, resurgence of religious uh, religious fervor, there's always an ethnic element attached to it, a political element attached to it, and uh, theological analysis into, into the situation needs to account for all these uh, parts of it, uh, which are working simultaneously, uh, it would seem. Uh, what about other religious groups like Buddhists and Hindus? Are they also facing challenges in Malaysia? And this is me trying to clarify the context before we get into the conversation about uh, that part. Uh, um, how is their situation compared with Christianity in relation to uh, Islam in Malaysia? Now, I must say relatively, uh, we do not see much religious persecution uh, in Malaysia. Huh? Generally, we don't see that. Perhaps there may be some form of restrictions in a sense of um, uh, for us to build religious buildings, there might be some restrictions getting um, uh, approval from the uh, relevant authorities. So, uh, so as far as uh, the non-Islamic religion is concerned, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism or Christianity, we live peacefully in that sense. There's not much religious persecution as we, can, we see in other the parts of Asia. Uh, but what we do see is that uh, apostasy, for example, when we talk about apostasy, apostasy Islam is something that is non-negotiable. And that is something that perhaps as non-Muslim, we need to respect that stand because that has been enshrined in our constitution that uh, other faith uh, can freely practice their, 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 their religion, but we uh, should not uh, evangelize the Muslims. So that was uh, quite clear in that sense within our uh, our our context. Yeah. So I would say relatively it's peaceful. There's no religious persecution in that sense. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That um, actually resonates with the situation in India too, where uh, on a daily basis, um, obviously there are pockets of persecution and incidents. But there is also relative calm, uh, although things might be changing. But there's also the uh, conversion uh, uh, bill that we have, anti-conversion bill, which uh, prohibits conversion, uh, uh, forcible conversion, to be precise. So uh, there is this balance that needs to be maintained with the law of the land and uh, our relationship with the communities around. Hmm. So the church in Malaysia is uh, living in this situation uh, and with this undercurrent of pressure or uh, a difficult situation, it's an undercurrent in some ways, it's not uh, overtly there uh, as you stated. Uh, and in this you said, uh, right, and this is a difficult section to be honest, uh, towards the end of the section, you're right, the church in Malaysia is reminded that without the cross, there is no Christian gospel no church of christ without suffering there is no pauline mission no christian proclamation and when i read this i was like this is difficult because all these um, aspects that we celebrate about being christian especially as evangelicals you're saying that without suffering these do not exist now we've talked about it on a conceptual level uh, before but I wanted to bring it down to the daily lives of churches. Uh, what would this section and this conversation on suffering and its integral connect to mission and uh, Christian proclamation mean for the daily lives of churches, missionaries, pastors, and laity in Malaysia? How does this translate to daily lived interactions in society? Yeah, I think um, it was a, a sort of a reminder for me that we need to be faithful witness for the gospel. Now, within the context of Malaysia, I say that 
um, uh, uh, because of the different ethnic group, because of the different uh, culture, because of the different religions that are involved, it sometimes complicates matter. Now, let me give you um, an example. Um, when we were translating the Bible into our national language, which is the Malay language, and we we, we 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 had a little problem as to how we're going to translate the name of God. Now, this has been a very thorny issue in Malaysia. There were court cases, and it gets everyone gets so emotional when we talk about this particular issue. How do we translate the name of God into our Malay language Bible? Do we use the word Allah? Or not. So for the Muslim, they say no. You Christian, could, you should not be using uh, the name of our God. But for the Christian, we say that if we go back history, the first Malay Bible that was being translated for Indonesia and Malaysia at that point in time in in the early 1600, the word Allah has been used to translate the name of God. And so, um, so in our in our Malay Bible, that name was being used, and that caused a lot of tension uh, with the church, with the state, with the authority. So that's just one example why, for us, it was so difficult about this Bible translation. <laughs> but it can be a small issue, but it turned out to be a big issue. And it, even within the Christian circles, there are there are a debate whether we, we should think of another different terminology uh, that we could use to translate the name of God. And so this debate continue. And, and, and this is just one example where it can be uh, it can be just a name of a day of God, and yet it can cause uh, divisions. It, 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 it could cause an emotional outburst. It could cause people to react. And, 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 and that's just one example. Uh, uh, there are many examples, can, but just, just to give us a glimpse, because I briefly talk about that in the book, and I give references to some of these cases that were involved and to help our readers understand the context where I'm coming from. Mm. Mm, um... So uh, th this is uh, interesting because there are many articles and uh, uh, reams <laughs> written on the uh, use of the word Allah and can it be the same as the Christian God? And we have many uh, scholars across the globe uh, writing on it. But you present a very real and tangible situation where um, the Malay Christians were faced uh, and Malaysian Christians as a whole were faced with this question. Can we use the name Allah? And there were, as you said, court cases attached to it, and that uh, would uh, this uh, example also would uh, show that words are not just words, but they have meaning attached to history and uh, 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 other uh, parts of the context. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how uh, the Malaysian Christians uh, responded to uh, this, or I'm. I'm I'm guessing there was not one response, but maybe give us a glimpse into some responses that came out of it to get a, uh, uh, a look at how uh, uh, one can respond to this from within the context instead of just as an academic uh, endeavor from the outside. Yeah, there were different, of course, as you mentioned, there were different responses. Some of them will say, uh, no, we should think of another name. Some say, no, and this name has historically been using that we should continue on. And what complicates matter is that uh, in some of ethnic language in Malaysia, like one of them is the, a, a tribal group called Iban. They are one of the large majority of the natives here in Malaysia. In the Iban language, uh, Allah is also being used as well. So it's not just the Malay language, but also other languages as well, and so 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 it's actually a very complicated issue when you try to think of it epistemologically, you think about it theologically, you think about it contextually. So there are a lot of issues that involved. So it's just not uh, an academic exercise. Oh yeah, you can use, you can't use because of this reason, this reason. Right. But there were other uh, contributing factors that we had to think of as well. So that that makes contextual theology in that sense exciting, you know. You go down to the ground, you deal with the issues at the grassroots and you ask the people, what if I tell you that you should use another name for God? How would that shape your understanding of who God is? How would that mm. just like for us when we speak in English, we use the word God. What if one fine day we are told that we can't use God? 
we have to use mm. higher being, for example. So by using the terminology higher being or deities, for example, how would that shape our understanding of who God is? How would that shape us uh, in our understanding of the concept of chaos, for example? You know, so, so these are issues that I think um, is far more complicated and much more complex. So contextual theology is just not it's just not uh, a nice name that we do, but it actually deals with the <laughs> daily reality. And it deals with the concepts, ideas, the worldviews, and there's much more at stake, actually. Mm. I, uh, I, I like that. And I think this is a great invitation to, our, um, uh, to the students and our uh, audiences. Contextual theology is exciting and uh, it's a dynamic field. And uh, Dr. Karyon Lim uh, is a New Testament scholar, so you do not need to be uh, just a student of contextual theology. We're engaging in it uh, in contextual theology from different perspectives and different angles. And it's always moving, always changing. Uh, the debate is ongoing. And just to uh, conclude this part, uh, is there some sort of consensus right now uh, uh, in the Malaysian church or is this an ongoing conversation? Uh, yes, this is ongoing conversation. <laughs> It is an ongoing conversation because we have issues legally, we have issues contextually, we have issues theologically. So it's always an ongoing um, issue as we navigate through all these difficult circumstances. <laughs> yeah. mm. Okay, um, so uh, for the audiences and uh, for myself also, let's keep an eye on this because uh, there's something rich happening there uh, which will help uh, not just the ch uh, church in Malaysia, but uh, the church Catholic across uh, the globe uh, as we try to grapple with this situation. And I liked how you put the shoe on the other foot by saying, what if we cannot use the word God? Because sometimes we think uh, this is an isolated incident far away, but uh, we assume God is a given. But God is also a word appropriate from a, there's a certain history attached to it. What if we can't use that? What changes? So this is something relevant to all of us uh, today. Um, so you mentioned uh, this part of contextual theology where you need to go to the grassroots and ask people questions and related to that uh, you uh, say in this chapter this changing face of mission demands that we read the bible from the grassroots perspective of a religious minority experiencing social injustice and political powerlessness rather than from an elite position of prestige and power could you uh, elaborate a little more on this. How would this reading look like? What are the differences? Because uh, uh, especially as evangelicals, um, and uh, I'm not talking about in academia, but uh, on a general level, uh, we tend to think there's one reading of the Bible, right? We read the Bible, the Bible speaks to us, and that is it. But uh, you seem to suggest that, that there are different ways of reading the Bible. Uh, can you explain to us and give us an insight on how this would look like? Yeah, perhaps I can just give one illustration, which I actually mentioned in one of my books you 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 introduced earlier on about um, the uh, Jesus, a storyteller, uh, uh, looking at the parables mm. of Jesus. One of the parables I reflected on in this book uh, is the parable of the vineyard workers from Matthew uh, chapter 20. Now, in this parable that Jesus told, Jesus mentioned that the kingdom of heaven is like a master, you know, who went out early to hire laborers for his vineyard. So he hired one uh, at the beginning of the day. He hired a group at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock. But at the end of the day, he paid everyone equally. Now, from... From someone who live, uh, uh, I'm like a city boy, you know, <laughs> very much influenced by the West, very much influenced by capitalist uh, ideology. I would say this is unfair. How could you pay someone who start work at six o'clock the same salary as someone who work at five o'clock? One person work twelve hours, one person work one hour. He had the same pay. This is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, uh, when I was teaching this parable, I asked my students, Can, what, what title will you give this particular parable? One of my students suggested, this is a parable of a very poor HR manager who reviews the salary of workers to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, but when I was in Pakistan, this hit, hit home. Um, uh, when I was in Pakistan, um, we were driving through a market square 
in one of the one of the one of the cities, and it was early in the morning, and I saw a large group of people lining up the market square with the tools in their hand. So I asked a friend who was taking me, I said, "What are these people doing?" He said, "Oh, these are uh, laborers." Uh, they will come out early in the morning to the market square with their tools, hoping that someone will come and pick them up and hire them. Now, obviously, I ask the next question: uh, What if they didn't get picked up? What if nobody hired them? Uh, I say, well, that's that's very unfortunate. That would mean that they may not have any salary for that day. So the question I had in my mind: hey, How would these people, if they are not being hired, fit? Their family, and then suddenly it hit home by reading this parable afresh. Now we tend to think that we are the six o'clock early in the morning worker, and we should have the best <laughs> deal. But if we put our shoes to those who who are like uh, the people that I saw in Pakistan, who line up the streets hoping that they will be employed by someone, and with the hope that at the end they will have money to feed the family. Imagine they come at six o'clock. They didn't get picked up. Nine o'clock, they didn't get picked up. Noon, they didn't get picked up. Three o'clock, they didn't get picked up. Now we put ourselves into the shoes of these people. What would have gone through their mind? The sense of anxiety, the sense of worriness. Oh, look, um, I couldn't find job today. I'm not going to have any money to put food on the table at the end of the day. What if somebody came at five o'clock and said, "Hey, come, you go and work in my vineyard. I'll pay you what is fair." And the person got a full day's wages. How would the people reading from the five o'clock laborers? How would that add a different dimension、uh, to our understanding? So I tested out this reading to different groups of people, and the result was actually quite amazing. And it suddenly dawned on、mm. us that God. Never shortchange anyone. Whether you're six o'clock, twelve o'clock, five o'clock, three o'clock, God is there for everyone. And I think this experience of mine、um, when I was in Pakistan、uh, hit really hit home <laughs> to me、uh, to rethink about when we read、uh, the scriptures. If we come from a position, I would call myself, you know, I'm、um, I'm a typical Christian, middle class, you know. When I read scripture from that point, I may miss out certain things that someone who would go to the market square every day, hoping to be picked up so that he can get work and get paid at the end of the day, what would that what would that person read the scripture? What would they get out of it? That is why I often advocate that when we sit together, it would be nice for people from different nationality, different background. Uh, uh, reading the Bible together, I think this is where iron sharpens iron, and we begin to see how the Scripture, the Word of God,、uh, can means can can speak to all of us coming from different contexts、mm. and different、uh, situations.、Mm. So there were lots of、um, moving parts and elements in that, which、uh, I would quickly like to highlight.、Um, First of all, there was、uh, this real life、um, experience that you had being in Pakistan and seeing a situation which connected. And then you mentioned you、uh, thought of、uh, the parable in a different way, and then you took it and uh, had uh, presented it to people and had them read it and、uh, in in a way read it back to you and their perspectives on it. And the third part was reading it together. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the parable or the Bible in general together, and seeing different perspectives on it,、uh, that is really helpful. Which makes me、uh, actually it connects nicely with the uh, uh, next thing that I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, we teach in seminaries, and we are hoping to train uh, uh, leaders, missionaries, pastors who are effective.、Uh, And this I found even with my own uh, students. Uh, many a times they say that uh, uh, this is very interesting and nice,、uh, but this will not apply to uh, uh, practical or real ministry. Now, what you're presenting here would、uh, make it seem that、uh, it's possible that we can、uh, actually make that connection even in our curriculum. So my question to you is that how can we in seminaries, Bible colleges,、um, address this、uh, aspect of reading from the grassroots? Because it would seem that we are not、uh, well equipped to do that at present.
Yes. Uh, uh, and what I try to do is if we could have, if you hear voices uh, from different groups of people, uh, that would be helpful. Now, the thing is, um, that is where I, I always believe that a very mixed classroom can be helpful. People coming from different nationality, different ethnic group, different uh, social realities. When you put them together and you get them to read the text together, what hits you? When you read this particular parable, for example, what hits you? I mean, just like the parable that I alluded to early on, for many of us who are middle class, capitalists, uh, coming from the capitalist uh, worldview, we would say this is unfair. This is unfair, <laughs> you know. But for those who come from uh, the grassroots or those who are marginalized, they will say that how God answered our prayer. You just don't know how much we suffer, how much anxiety we went through throughout the day under the hot sun, hoping and praying that someone will hire us, but no one actually hired us. But came a generous. Uh, 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 a, a vineyard owner and hire us at the last minute. So I think this kind of conversation can be quite helpful. And sometimes I may put our students into different social realities. Imagine you were this group of people. Imagine you were this group of people. How, mm. how, how, what, what hit you when you read this particular uh, text? Or what hit you when you read this particular passage? When you think outside your own context, outside your own uh, social reality, think about others, what sort of uh, things that would hit you. And, and I often find that to be helpful because it then forces us to rethink what we are reading. Because sometimes when you read the gospel, for example, we're so familiar with the stories. Uh, we will never think it from the other perspective. <laughs> and we think this is the only reading, you know, just like what you mentioned, all oh, this is not relevant. I remember when I was in seminary in, in the United States, when we were talking about First Corinthians, I still remember my New Testament professor say that, oh, when we come to First Corinthians chapter 8 to chapter 10 about food sacrifice to idol, this is completely irrelevant for us. But not so within our context. I did think you and I, we can resonate with that when we talk about food sacrifice yeah. to idol. And it, it's a daily reality we see uh, within our right. context. <laughs> mm. That um, picture of a classroom with dialogue and perspectives uh, across the board is helpful because um, I think it emphasizes the need... Um, for the conversation to go beyond uh, the confines of our group. Uh, and uh, in, in some ways, uh, this is also connecting with the idea of the uh, universal church, the Catholic church, that we are all interconnected in our reading. So uh, uh, going to the professor uh, in the US, uh, there might be some aspects of the gospel that might uh, jump out and be relevant to them and may not jump out to us as much uh, in Asia and may not be relevant. So maybe when we put together our readings, we can have a richer understanding. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that is helpful. Uh, so uh, talking of uh, reading uh, and uh, the life, the Christian life, um, you mentioned uh, uh, we, towards the concluding parts of the chapter, we need a fresh reading of Paul's perspective on suffering and an urgent rediscovery of the missiological significance of suffering. Uh, I'm thinking uh, of this, how uh, do our re uh, reading of the Bible and daily lives, how do they interconnect uh, uh, and impact each other? And when I say daily lives, I'm thinking beyond the church when uh, the uh, congregants go to the during their work, their week. Uh, uh, do we first change our reading of the Bible, uh, like take a top-down approach, uh, and that leads to change in our daily lives, or is it the other way around? Like uh, you expressed uh, and uh, give the example from uh, your trip to Pakistan, that our daily lives result in a different reading of the Bible. Uh, which academicians can learn from by interacting with the grassroots? Uh, or is there a third <laughs> way uh, <laughs> from the top down, bottom up? Or is there a third way of looking at this? Well, I like to think it like a concentric circle. Like the text inform us. The text 
transform us and shape us and help us see through our daily realities. And then again, that help us to read the text. Okay, it's sort of a little concentric circles that goes on this way. And, and over the years, uh, I had the privilege of uh, teaching in different contexts. You know. uh, I, I would teach, like, say, for example, Introduction to New Testament or Exegesis of Mark or Exegesis in 1 Corinthians in different countries in, in, in Asia. Now, what always amazes me is that uh, in each context, I hear different issues. I hear different voices. And that has helped me as an instructor and as a teacher. Uh, for example, if I were to teach First Corinthians, in some certain contexts, the issue of women leadership, women remain silent, became a primary issue that we deal with. And in certain mm -hmm. contexts, it was the gifts of the Spirit uh, that became the primary issue. Then in some contexts, it was food sacrifice to idol that became a, a central issues to the people that were struggling through uh, 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 their daily living. And in some contexts, it's church divisions. And, and I remember teaching this course in a context where there are different uh, uh, natives, tribal groups that together. And they say unity of the church is the most difficult concept that they grapple with because each tribe, or each clan comes with their own worldviews, their own uh, identity and their own cultural uh, 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 expectation and they find it hard to work with others. So unity become uh, a main trust of understanding First Corinthians. So if there's anything, that is just one example I can think of where uh, my experience in teaching, uh, say for example, First Corinthians in different contexts has actually enriched me so much. Like what you say early on, uh, the, the, the professor in the US that like I mentioned, it may not be issue that's relevant to them, but it could be relevant to somebody else. And the issue that's very relevant for me may not even be an issue to others, but they can also learn from me. So this is where I think within right. the Catholic global church, uh, there's much that mm. we can learn uh, from one another. Uh, that's one. And not only uh, within the global church, but I think if you think beyond our theological persuasions, there are also things that we can learn from one another. You know, sometimes we, we evangelical read the text in one particular way, but when we sit down with our Catholic brothers and sisters, or we sit down our Lutheran brothers and sisters, or with our Anglican brothers and sisters, we learn uh, different things. We see things differently. And this is where I think it is helpful and insightful. Like personally, I have been uh, very much enriched and some of this experience of mine uh, actually find its way into some of my writings as well. It shaped the way I, I, I think theologically in the way I do contextual uh, theology. Mm. This, this is really helpful and um, you know, actually um, points out uh, an important part of this uh, or the reasoning behind this podcast series. Um, and uh, this is not just to students, but uh, 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 pastors, missionaries, or just uh, um, uh, laity, uh, everyday Christians, or anyone listening to this. Uh, this podcast series is continuing the work that is started in the book, Asian Christian Theology, Evangelical Perspectives. Uh, we're inviting you to, to a conversation. So we want to hear from you. Uh, like this podcast uh, conversation uh, with Dr. Karyum Lim is not a one-way uh, monologue uh, that we are having and presenting an idea to you, but we want to hear back. So uh, this will be available in shorter formats, uh, shorter videos, and very short videos, also 30 to 45 seconds also. Uh, we want to hear back because, and not just to hear back and know what you're thinking or what you think about this, but to learn from you as well. And we have a team who will be responding to comments and qu queries on this. So I invite you to this conversation. That is very helpful. Uh, and across uh, different uh, denominations, theological persuasions, I like that idea because that's often uh, neglected or a weak point <laughs> for evangelicals uh, because uh, there's a tendency to think that we have it right and others do not. <laughs> Uh, uh, that is helpful. I would love to go into more of this, uh, but obviously uh, we are limited with uh, uh, time. So I want to um, have this conversation ongoing 
uh, beyond the limits of this interview right now. So could you tell us a little bit uh, about new projects that you're working on, that you're excited about? These could be your own projects, others uh, uh, that uh, even our audiences can look forward to and follow. Uh. Yeah, I'm working on a couple of projects on social identity uh, formation. And I'm actually working on a monograph on uh, social identity formation in Paul's uh, letter to the Philippians. And I also have another project on First Peter that will be uh, coming up. And I also uh, would like to continue on writing one of the books that you mentioned, The Following Jesus. It's supposed to be a trilogy, uh, Following Jesus, Following Paul, and Following John. Following Jesus covering the uh, the sites in the Holy Land in Israel. Following Paul cover Greece and Turkey. And then Following John covers Revelation. So, uh, uh, so that was a little project that I had because I, I lead study tours to biblical lands as well. And so oftentimes uh, after the tour, there will always be requests, could I have your, uh, could I have your notes and photographs? Let me put together everything so you can have it. So you know <laughs> which sites, which places you have been to, you know which buildings you are looking at, you, you know which stones you are looking at. So hopefully that <laughs> might be helpful for those who might want to go on pilgrimage uh, to biblical lands. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I see um, from uh, the works that you just uh, um, noted that you have a very diverse and <laughs> audience uh, that you address, uh, people who visit the Holy Land, but also questions about social uh, identity formation, which are crucial in Asia. So there's almost like um, something for everyone to connect to with your work. Uh, is there some place uh, where people can find you online, academia.edu, to follow your academic writings or a website, a blog, where they can follow Yeah, you. the easiest would be to follow my website. It would be kayonglim.com. Uh, I have not been blogging pretty much lately, but I hope to go back writing a little bit more on my website. So that will be one place to, uh, to follow uh, what I've been doing uh, uh, both in the academia and also in the church. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, is it okay if we put the link to your website in the description? Sure, the sure. Uh, yes, the please do so. Okay. Okay, excellent. Uh, th that is really helpful because uh, we do want this conversation to go on further. Um, Dr. Kari Lim, this has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for sparing uh, time from your busy schedule for us. Um, we wish you the best in all your endeavors and we look forward to what's coming next from you. For me personally, I'm looking out for the uh, work on First Peter and social uh, identity formation. It might be a little too late for my dissertation, but I will look forward to where it goes. Thank you so much for having Thank me you. and all the best for your PhD studies. Thank you. Thank you. This has been good.